Hey everyone, thank you for tuning into another episode with us today. I normally put out quite a few posts on social media and sort of get lots of people to chime in about what they want to hear and the direction the podcasts are going. And I know that I was talking about bringing in a podcast today around the development of emetophobia, you know, where it's come from and what we can do to make it worse and and maintain it. But me and Rob, we've decided to do a bit of a U-turn today and we're going to be discussing disgust propensity. So we'll talk about the development of emetophobia in the next one. But today is equally a very important topic to discuss because you can't have emetophobia without disgust propensity. So it does play a huge role within it. And when it's addressed, it's going to help you to start to move through your emetophobia and hopefully move towards overcoming it for good. So, Rob, could you break down for the people that are listening today what disgust propensity is and why it is so important within emetophobia? Yes, mate. Um, So, first of all, I would say it's impossible to have emetophobia without having high disgust propensity. So I've talked before about um, simplifying our understanding of psychological symptoms and mental health symptoms as as ingredients like in a cake mix. Okay, and I apologise for the oversimplification, but I believe it's absolutely correct. Uh, As in, you cannot make a chocolate cake without chocolate. Okay, if you had flour, water, sugar, eggs, and whatever else you need to make a cake, clearly I don't make cakes. Okay, you'd have a, a, a sponge cake, right? If you add chocolate, you're going to turn it into a chocolate cake. Whether you like it or not, adding chocolate makes a chocolate cake, right? And you can't make a chocolate cake without chocolate. That one ingredient changes everything, okay? Psychological symptoms, mental health symptoms are very, very similar in as much as they're incredibly predictable, incredibly predictable, you know? And metaphobes have a unique skill set that creates their emetophobia, as does someone that's depressed, as does someone that's got a phobia of spiders. You understand that a phobia of spiders is different to a phobia of lifts. What's the difference? For some reason, spiders are involved. For some reason, lifts are involved. With emetophobia, it's, it's again, it's their own unique um, set of ingredients, about 26 different ingredients that we're going to talk about next podcast, that go to create disgust propensity, that go to create emetophobia. Disgust propensity is the thing that changes it from being just a normal, in inverted commas, obsessive anxiety or obsessive disorder or OCD or something like that into specifically emetophobia, okay? Without disgust propensity, that these emetophobes would still have a lot of anxiety, would still have a, um, a focal point for uh, their mental health anxiety if you like or a mental health issue or or or, or a, a, a intrusive uh, uh, anxious thoughts or something but it wouldn't be about emetophobia it would be more an obsessive anxiety generally you add chocolate to that mix you add a uh, disgust propensity to mix and it makes emetophobia okay and we've talked about this before because this is why the majority of sufferers are female as opposed to female and male uh because Males, on the whole, do not create anywhere near the same level of disgust propensity as females do. Okay, and that's partly due to the amount of social anxiety uh, females, women have uh, to men, and, and as we know, they have an awful lot more, particularly in their early childhood and their teenage years. And social anxiety is a major contributor to disgust propensity. So, what is disgust propensity? It's me waffling. Disgust propensity is the is the amount of disgust that you create in relation to a bodily function in this particular case vomiting okay now nobody likes it we've talked about before most people would look away if they saw it on the path okay on the road or in the sink or something most people would perceive it as disgusting because it smells and it's yucky right but most people, as we know, could see it and go, uh, and be completely unaffected by it other than going, uh, and walk off. Whereas a metaphobes, and particularly if it's their own, you know, could be reduced to, to, you know, a gibbering wreck at the sight of it. Okay. So their response to it 
their sensitivity to vomit and the amount of disgust they generate in relation to it is much, much higher than average. And that plays a massive part. For some reason, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, they generate an awful lot more disgust about it than the average person. Okay, and that's a major contributing part to their metaphobia. Okay, without it, they would not have it. So disgust propensity is a major, major key holder, stakeholder within a metaphobia. Um, and uh, components of disgust propensity, and disgust propensity, again, for clarity, is the amount of disgust, that horrible, horrible, that is disgusting, that feeling that just goes beyond, uh, and it's a visceral feeling where you just, you can't look, you can't even talk about it, you can't even think about it. That's a very, very high level, a very, very strong reaction to something. If someone says, you know, I absolutely hate the Beatles, I think that's a strong reaction. I mean, I, I understand why you might not like them, but hate, that's a really, really, you know, that's, a, that's an overly strong reaction. And metaphobes have an overly strong reaction, disgust reaction, to uh, vomit, sickness, seeing themselves doing it in front of other people or seeing other people do it, right? So it's a massive, massive overreaction. We've talked about this before, but what I wanted to talk about today was kind of where does that come from? So... You cannot have a high disgust propensity for vomit and vomiting unless you've already got a certain amount of disgust on some level for yourself. Okay, so you've got to have a level of self-disgust for that then to be projected into something that you are doing inadvertently or not okay so in metaphobes and you're busy thinking back to when you had it now right and metaphobes have a level of self-disgust generally okay and therefore when they do something where they that they perceive is extra disgusting if you like that receives that it becomes the focus of their self-disgust of course and if you think about it disgusting Feeling disgust for something that you've done outside of yourself is kind of easier in a way, isn't it? Because it's now outside of yourself. I feel disgust for that thing that I did back there. I feel disgusted that I fell into that bad group of people and, and robbed that old lady when I was 18. I feel disgusted that looking back now that I didn't put the effort in to make my granddad's funeral. Okay, It's a real high level of feeling. And that high level of feeling really stems from contempt okay and contempt is that horrible horrible black and white um emotional moral it's it's a kind of a moral disgust okay that that is it's almost like an unforgivable feeling okay i am such a bad bad person for thinking or doing that thing so it's massively right i know uh, john gottman when he talked about contempt in relationships gottman did a lot of studies in relationships particularly in america about why relationships fail marriages fail and they studied a lot of um thousands of hours of videos of people in relationship therapy and he said mm. he said that, yeah. that if he if he listened to a couple of 30 second clips of the two people talking if if he could tell that contempt was there on either part, that relationship was doomed. It's almost unrecoverable. If one of those partners has got to the point right where where I now feel dis I now feel contempt for you, Joe, that just means there is nothing you can do right. Okay, I just I just feel this uh, feeling towards you. There's no you can go out of your way to try and make our marriage work and you can be the best husband in, in on the planet and you can you can work harder and you can overcome all those niggly things that I told you were bothering me and were pushing me away and were, were 
you know, stopping me from loving you anymore and this kind of stuff, right? But when you get to the point where it's contempt, nothing you do is ever going to be good enough. Everything didn't they, with, with, that, with that study, Rob, didn't they take it even further to draw the actual, they, they like, they squashed the audio so you couldn't actually make out the yes. words that the yeah. uh, the clients, the, the marriage clients were, were saying, but just the tone of the voice. And even to like, it was like a 90% degree of success, they were able to identify which marriages were, you know, yeah. which, so that which was, that was together. That, which, that was Nandini Gulati who took it. So she took, she had 10 second clips and she mm, put it through yeah, an audio yes. suppressor. She took out all the high frequency. So actually she said it was like listening through a glass at the wall. So you mm. couldn't even hear what was being said only the tone of voice. And if she could tell the tone of voice contempt was present, yep. okay, that relationship's over. So it's an attitude. Yep. Contempt is a pervasive, continual, everyone gets angry with their partners, right? Every partner does something to upset the other partner at some point or they overreact or something. And for half an hour, I'm really angry at you, Joe, because you forgot it's our wedding anniversary, okay? And for that half an hour, there's nothing you can do right. Okay, you can try and make it up to me. You can go buy me flowers. You can buy me chocolates. You can take me out. Then you can cancel your day at work tomorrow. I say, right, don't worry. I'll, to make it up to you, Rob, we we'll go out for the day. Okay, but while I'm in that zone, there's nothing you can do to make it right. I just feel contempt. Okay, that mm. passes, and we get back on an even keel, and I get out. Right, but contempt then is a continuous, permanent, present feeling of. There's just nothing you can, there's nothing you can do to make it up to me. I now have this opinion of you, Joe, and it's not going away. Okay, it's yeah. there. That's it. Just contempt. When that's there, that relationship to him. So what the research is saying, then, when someone, when someone has a high level of disgust, uh, um, what they actually have is a high level, on some level, of self-contempt. Now, of course, we know that fits in perfectly with perfectionism. We know a metaphobes of, you can't see, I'm sticking my thumb up, right? Where is the camera? Here. Okay. Perfectionism and social anxiety as well, which fit perfectly into that. What is a perfectionist? A perfectionist is someone who's running away from feeling contempt for themselves. A perfectionist is someone who's running away from feeling that I'm not good enough, I'm, I'm failing, um, I'm unlovable, I'm not nice enough, I'm not whatever enough. A mm. perfectionist is someone who 95% success isn't good enough, they still feel shit. It's got to be perfect, it's got to be 100%. Then I'm going to get away from all these horrible feelings that I can't tolerate and I don't like. I've got to be brilliant at it, I've got to be exceptional at it, I've got to be perfect at it in order to get away from these feelings i can't cope i can't tolerate these yucky feelings that i'm not good enough okay the research says um that a lot of kind of psychological and psychiatric disorders like uh, borderline personality ocd this kind of stuff have a degree of this kind of self-contempt the self-disgust uh, um attribute to them and and if you think about it if you if you have someone who, who's growing up and we know we've said before a lot of sufferers are white middle class people right the vast majority of emetophobes are white middle class people and white middle class people tend to have parents that are are um intellectually pushier than working class people generalizing massively i get that right okay generalizing massively so White middle class people are going to, uh, even if they've got the loveliest, most well balanced, most psychologically uh, sensitive, caring parents on the planet, children of these parents are going to feel under more pressure to perform well. The expectations on them are going to feel much higher even if the parents don't say you've got to get a's at school you've got to be a really good boy you've got to you know you've got to shine above all your peers even if they don't say that quite often 
people feel that because that's what the parents did or because they live in a posh house or because they've got two cars or they have lots of holidays or dad's a doctor or a dentist or, or a lawyer or a, do you know what I mean? That You don't have to have parents that physically tell you you're failing, Joe, you've got to work harder. Quite often the child will perceive that there is a a pressure upon them to be of a certain standard and that they're failing to meet that standard. Some kids that have got, uh, uh, you know, uh, that are more adaptive and got more problem solving skills might tolerate that better and um, not be uh, affected by that, that kind of belief within themselves. Others might take it really to heart, um, particularly if they've got a strong desire for control and feel like they're failing all the time and feel like they're not good enough and not cope very well with that feeling and try and work really, really hard to get away from that feeling and that's where kind of perfectionism comes in social anxiety again we know that as a projection of self-esteem to a greater or lesser extent right a projection of self-esteem if you don't feel very happy with yourself you're going to worry that other people are going to think about that as well about you if i'm really insecure about being bald i'm going to worry that other people are going to think that as well if i'm really happy about it i don't really care what people think about my baldness right so i'm happy with me I don't really care about it. If I'm happy with me going to the loo or occasionally swearing or occasionally being sick, it's not going to bother me that other people would know that or see that either. Okay, so those things link in together. But I think it's the first time really that we've linked that disgust propensity for the specific act of being sick to a disgust propensity at oneself. There is some, there has to be some level of self-disgust for that to come out in an action that that person is doing okay and that self-disgust is more about self-contempt okay that permanent thought that permanent belief of I am just not good enough I am a bad person I'm a failing person I feel guilty I, but you know, they look at themselves more than other people. I mean, metaphorically speaking, they think about it more, they obsess about it more, they catastrophize, they brood about it, they try harder than the average person to be better. Most of the research says that people with with a, 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 an obsessive side of the nature, certainly those with OCD, have a much higher than normal level of moral and ethical development. Okay, they are they are more moral. They have m higher moral standards. Well, if you've got higher moral standards you're going to feel that you're failing more, aren't you? Yeah. Mm. And we know this also because we, we've coached loads of people to do the um, positives list, which is part of the Thrive program, right? The positives list in order to build self-esteem. And how many times did the metaphobe say, but I haven't done anything amazing this week? And we yeah. have to say to them, we're not after amazing. We're after just something that you've done something nice someone said to you some task you've completed and they're looking for big things they're looking for massive things why because these average things aren't big enough to make them feel good about themselves because there is this loathing on some level this contempt on some level that i am just not good enough i'm never going to be good enough I've always got this self-doubt. I'm not as good as you. You are somehow on a higher level than me. You, 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 you're on a higher plane than I am. And that self-contempt, that self-disgust, I am just not good enough. Okay? Which is also a reason why uh, metaphobes, particularly metaphobes, the only people I know in a clinical sense that go into blips more than the meta to people with borderline personality disorder. Okay. A full blown, I don't think it's called that anymore. Uh, um, personality disorder. Okay. The blipping, but a metaphobes blip a lot and they would do. It's understandable when you think of it as contempt, mm. that, that black and white, I am just a terrible, stupid person. You think about the contempt they feel when they go into a blip, mm. it's always, yep. I am so stupid. I am such yep. an idiot. Why did I do that? I am so useless. We see it. We've done. We've done podcasts on uh, um, why metaphobes uh, think they're not going to make it. Why they think they're going to be the one that fails because they're the one that has this level of 
contempt. Of course it's going to be me that fails. I'm an idiot. Why would it work for me? Why, 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 should, I be, why should I be the one that gets over it? It's almost like a yeah. kind of survivor guilt thing that I don't deserve to because I'm just not good enough to do it. So that's, that's the deeper version of um, disgust. It, it, it comes from a self-disgust on some level, on some level, and it might not be obvious, it might be unconscious, okay? But on some level, I just hate myself. Mm. Now that rings a bell, doesn't it? <laughs> it rings a bell with a, a, a lot of people that I speak to with a metaphobia on a, on a daily basis. Um, the number one word that I hear when they're dealing with a blip or coming out the back end of it is my least favorite word, which is should. I should have been doing this. I should be doing it differently by now. I should be in this place, right? Because it's that comparison of, well, I've worked this hard and I've, and I've done this, but I'm not there, but I should be. Yeah. yeah, and they completely forget about everything that they've done up to that point. They completely yes. forget of all the times they've been to that concert for the first time, or they've gone out for dinner, or they've managed to eat a bit of fish food, or they've managed to have their first glass of wine in ten years, or they were able to comfort their their baby when they were unwell. It goes out the window. Yeah, completely goes out the window. I shouldn't be feeling this way right now, so I'm a massive failure. Yes, and you know that's just perspective gone. So really interesting chat about self-disgust there but to touch on disgust in relation to things outside of you as well i think is also important and if we're looking at the way in which an emetophobia sufferer does find things outside of them significantly more disgusting than say a a rugby boy or girl right in in the way that someone that is brought up through it's something that i joke about quite often with um lightly joke about with mums that I'm taking through that are emetophobic and they're absolutely petrified as you can understand of their child developing emetophobia as the child gets older and they learn it and you know the, the mum has seen just how miserable it is to live with emetophobia and the the idea of their their child doing that as well is you know absolutely awful so I joke with them I say listen did you put your child into a into a rugby club um, from the the day they can start walking the chances of them developing a disgust propensity high enough to create emetophobia being part of the, the rugby club is it's going to be slim because they're they've got all their rugby initiations they're going to be going through they're going to be rolling around in mud on a daily basis they're going to be in the changing room seeing everyone and you know with a, a lack of clothes on and all the culture that comes with rugby Snot everything and about blood it breeds and yeah dirt everything and about grime it. and mud and muck yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how can emetophobes start to challenge their disgust propensity in relation to things outside of them? You know, if, for example, the, the idea of if they're doing some washing up in the sink and you get all the bits of food that it gets stuck in the bottom of the drain cover and that's all stuck there. If I, I can, can sort of spitballing here, but I can imagine if I asked all of my clients, whether or not they would be able to just put their hand through the water and pick up all of the chunky food at the bottom and put it in the bin with a bare hand without wearing a yellow marigold, would they be able to do that? You know, almost, almost all of them, if not all of them would say, no way, disgusting, yes. not a chance. So very, very good question. Um, when you use the example of uh, um, rugby, I use the example of looking after horses. Mm. For the same reason, nice, you know, yeah. snotty, dribbly horse, mucking out afterwards, walking around in horse manure and, and all the muck and filth and sloshing that away and horse wee and scraping it all up, you know. And I've said before, you know, if someone grows up around horses, they're less likely to develop a metaphobia. And, and I've got no research to back that up, by the way, but yep. I've said that dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And I only have had one person that said, actually I ride um, uh, and I would have said anything you can do to normalize that external disgust I mean I did 
for my sins, right? I did once suggest to a mum and a young lad, you know, th th they find the fact that the dog pooing in the garden is, is terrifying. And I said, actually, what you want to do then one day is go and pick some of that up. I don't mean in your hand, right? But put some gloves on and pick it up and kind of expose yourself to that, not run away mm. from it. And actually... It sounds really gooey, right? But but look at it and get a knife and cut it up and maybe look at it under the school microscope and run it under the tap and watch it disintegrate. Just just to just to normalise the thoughts and feelings around it. And you could do the same with anything, you know, in terms of bodily functions. Something we've talked about before is, you know, someone like Mary, the eighty-six-year-old who got over a metaphobe after seventy-five years. She's 86 and never had a wee in front of somebody else. She's never normalised mm. that bodily function. You and I, clearly not together at the same time, right? But you and I were, were weeing in front of other boys when we were three or four years old. You know, I know it may have been interesting and exciting and frightening and shameful and whatever the first five times you did it. By the time you're six and you've had your privates out in front of other people dozens and dozens of times and weed and, and you know, tried to wee the, the little... Uh, you know, uh, uh, um, dental stick or, or cigarette butt or whatever, and to get it to go down the toilet or something. You know, boys just have normalised all that, the, those uh, mm. personal hygiene kind of issues way, way before. A, a lady, a woman might go her entire life and never we in front of another person. So how do, you, how do you overcome that? Well, you expose yourself to it. You can do that. But also, and this is the important bit, just exposing yourself to those other uh, uh, um, things that you might feel disgusted about externally, I don't think is enough. And I don't think we'll do it in itself because if I'm, if I'm disgusted at this tea bag here, right? Because it's sitting there on my side, okay? The disgust I feel for that tea bag, remember, is only a projection of the disgust I feel for myself. Mm. So, I could I could overcome it about the tea bag, right? I could I could get some all the tea bags we use in the house today. I can open them up in my hands, let it run through my fingers, and just do that for five minutes a day, right? And I'd probably get over my disgust for tea bags, right? But I'm still going to have the disgust for myself. The disgust for tea bags was only a projection of my own internal massively high standards, and and uh, you know self-contempt on some level okay so you you have to in order to overcome the disgust propensity one feels for vomit and vomiting you have to overcome the disgust you feel for yourself you have to overcome that self-contempt you have to overcome that perfectionism and this is why another reason why as far as we can tell only the thrive program works regularly predictably to overcome a metaphobia because it's the only thing that works on all of those components it's the only program that works on building self-esteem overcoming social anxiety overcoming perfectionism calming down catastrophizing changing that black and white thinking feeling good about yourself liking yourself more on all those levels all of those things contribute to that self-disgust that self-contempt that i'm not good enough I don't accept myself, you know, I'm a bad person, I need to work harder, no one's going to like me, there's something wrong with me. Okay, you think about it in uh, in eating doors, think about it with anorexia, think how powerful that self-disgust is or the self-contempt is within anorexia, being massively under body weight and incredibly ill to the point where you could die of it, but still believing that you're fat and ugly. Yes, yep. Yeah, that that's how strong mm. it's a cognitive distortion. It's a distorted thinking process. Yeah. OK, that's how strong contempt is. It's a cognitive bias like racism's a cognitive bias. OK, uh, um, being positive is a cognitive bias, right? Always seeing the negative things. So it's a cognitive bias that I always see myself through these shit tinted glasses. I'm never good mm. enough. So one has to work on that in order to overcome the self-disgust and then overcome the disgust propensity as well. 
Fantastic. Last question for you, Rob, on my end anyway. Is there anything else that you've come across in your professional experience in terms of mental health disorders, fears, phobias, whatever it is, that involves disgust, propensity outside of metaphobia that you can think of? I think probably only in psychiatric disorders um, mm. and in personality disorders. So, so things like BPD, borderline personality disorder, um, and any any anxiety or any mental health issue where there is that self contempt. Mm. I I would suggest that that if you look, you'll find that um you'll find some disgust propensity there, or certainly self disgust yeah. there. Okay. And don't and don't forget, you know, we're gonna talk about this next time. Until someone you know, you you can't covet something you've never seen, right? If you've never seen a, a Porsche or heard about Porsche or seen one on telly or seen a picture of one, you couldn't fantasize about having a Porsche, right? You don't know what they are. Okay. So until you've experienced something, it's very difficult to have a very negative view on it. And how we know this is true is because there are plenty of emetophobes, I think 26, 27% that have never been sick, never been sick. Mm. So, right. So it can't be the experience of being sick. That's creating this thing. It's, that would be typical of me to do something as disgusting as that. That's the worst thing I could do. Yeah. You, you do see it in people with intrusive thoughts. Okay. So people that have intrusive thoughts, people that are obsessive or have OCD and have intrusive thoughts, those horrible thoughts that just feel like they're coming out of nowhere. There, there is always a, a level of self disgust involved in that. Because if you think about it, if you think about it, what are intrusive thoughts? On the whole, intrusive thoughts are always of something that you wouldn't want to do. Yeah? Yes. Yep. Killing your granny, robbing a bank, stealing mm -hmm. that baby, grabbing a gun and shooting all those people. They're, they're, they're intrusive mm -hmm. thoughts are almost always about you doing something that society would judge you with contempt and disgust if you were found to have done it. Okay, so that fits perfectly. Also within OCD, what's the most common obsession? Of all the checking obsession, what's the most common obsession? Sorry? Hand washing. Hand washing. And what is hand washing? Hmm. You're washing it's something away. Disgusting. Yeah, you're washing away <laughs> guilt. Okay, mm. Pontius Pilate did it, uh, Lady Macbeth did it. Okay, you're feeling guilty, you're feeling dirty. What's, you know, you're feeling unclean, you're feeling not good enough, you're feeling like a failure, you're feeling like a bad person on some level. And that's a horrible, horrible feeling. Yep. Uh, final thing, when Gottman, going back to relationships, when Gottman was talking about relationships and he was talking about contempt, he said, criticism's a terrible thing in a relationship, right? Because criticism is saying that uh, um, you're not good enough. If I'm criticizing you for how much money you're bringing in to look after our family at the moment, Joe, and I'm criticizing you saying, come on, you could have worked last Saturday as well. We can't even put food on the table. Okay. That's a really unpleasant feeling. And of course you're going to get defensive and defend your position. Mm -hmm. Come on, Rob, I did 19 days on the trot or something. Okay. Contempt is qualitatively different, okay? Because contempt is viewing someone as a lesser person, yep. okay? Yep. And for some, and the reason relationships why it's so bad is because for someone that you love to treat you with contempt is the worst feeling in the world. Because someone who you yeah. put on a pedal, someone who who, who matters most to you is basically treating you like you are just no good. You're a piece of shit on my shoe. And that can be emotionally devastating. Gottman went on to say, you can get to the point where you can predict how many illnesses and colds and how much stress a person's under in life, how many stressful symptoms they have by whether their partner treats them with contempt or not. It, it, contempt in a relationship is so stressful that it can completely 
crush your immune system. Imagine mm. then having that towards yourself. We should have some yeah. music playing now. Yeah. Dum, 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 dum. It's it's massive. It's a massive, massive mm. component and a key component for people to challenge and overcome when overcoming their metaphobia. That's why it's so important to get the self-esteem high and predictable and internal. Not high self-esteem because yep. people are liking your stuff on Facebook, but high internal self-esteem. Really robust social confidence. Really liking yourself, being happy with yourself. You know, loving mm. yourself even. So, so, so important. You could not have a metaphobia without those things. Yep, and very doable. All of those things are very doable. Cool. All right, Brilliant. happy? Couple yeah. of bases there. Brilliant, mate. Very, very happy with that. Thank you. Lovely. Cheers. I hope everyone's enjoyed this listen. Quite a uh, uh, an intellectual deep dive today, but lots of important information and facts around emetophobia. So tune in to the next one. It is going to be about how we... What's that finger? I don't like it. Wait, 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 the next one's about how emetophobia is formed, right? I was going to say one thing. It is. To, yes. ev to evidence the points I've made today, I mm. bet this podcast gets more comments and more reactions than any others we've done so far mm. because it's such a, a, an ingrained intense it's a violence it's a self violence it's violence towards self there we are turning this podcast into a bit of a, a research study now to see what <clears> the <throat> results are yeah cool. see you next week all right cheers Rob. Cheers, thank you everyone Rob.